Hello everyone, I wanted to do a quick video on how you know if you're keto adapted. Uh, I've been doing ketogenesis for about three years on and off, really effectively doing it for the last year or so, and I wanted to uh, tell you how I know this. Uh, it's not called pea strips. Those ketone pea strips are not telling you the right kind of ketones. They're telling you what you're expelling out of your body, not actually how your body is using the ketones that you produce. So that's really important to understand. So this little baby here is the thing that pricks your finger. Um, you load it in. I've got my glucometer right here. Uh, pretty much this tells you, uh, it keeps a history of all your numbers, both your glucose and your ketone numbers. There's two different kinds of strips. The glucose strips are a lot less expensive. The ketone strips are probably like four or five times the price, so they can get pretty spendy. Um, if you want to check your ketones all the time. But pretty much if you know your glucose is, if you've done the ketone glucose strips and you kind of see the parallel what's going on there, uh, when your glucose gets pretty low, like down into the 60s and 70s, uh, your ketones always rise up to compensate because it's your secondary fuel source, right? So uh, I find that when I go 85, 90 or higher on my glucose, then I see my ketones will drop off, um, usually go below a two. I typically run around like around three, um, 2.5 to 3.5. I took my ketones a few days ago, they were like a 3.8, but that was after I had done a two hours of yard work and I was completely like um, probably just burning off fat because I, hadn't, I didn't have a lot of glucose source. I actually did on that day even eat like a handful of strawberries and uh, kind of like went a little bit higher on the on the carb side that day but even with that my ketones are still like rocketing out of control not out of control but um, really high and uh, my glucose that day was like you know still like in the 70s so what I tend to do though is when I check for consistency over time you want to check in the morning uh, when you wake up to see what your blood glucose is running at and then uh, it's also a good time to check the ketones at the same time when you got a little blood going for both of the strips uh, so you don't have to like poke yourself additional times so uh, pretty much I'll take my glucose and my ketones maybe like once every two once every week or two now um, I don't pretty much go over that just because um, I pretty much know when I'm in ketosis and just based on what you you, you just learn it over time uh, based on your food sources, what's coming in. If you know, you, you can uh, feel the even uh, for my mood, I can feel the evenness of my mood. Um, I feel just more imbalanced. I feel like I have more energy. When any lethargy sits in, you know, if I like have a meal, let's say, that's really high in carbo and protein at the same time, uh, that will sometimes send me into more appetite within maybe a half hour after I eat that. Um, and then maybe an hour after that, then I'll feel kind of a little woozy or drowsy. I won't have the energy, like the evenness that I normally would have. And that's the first indicator that your glucose is rising, your ketones might be falling, you're not like still keto adapted. So that's really the key is, um, well, I'm gonna try to hit this over the head again. This little puppy right here, this thing <laughs> checks your ketone blood, your, your ketone levels in your bloodstream. And that's what you want to know because if it's in your blood, there's a pretty darn good chance it's being used by your, your, your brain and your organs and everything else in your body. So that's the important takeaway is that's what you want to be testing if you know you're keto adapted. So let's say you don't have this guy, right? You don't have access to a glucometer or you just don't want to you don't you can't stand the side of blood or whatever it is so uh, you don't know your levels the problem remains where you don't really know if you're keto adapted you could be but typically I've had days where my glucose might be like you know in the 85 to 95 range and I think I'm keto adapted and I realize that I plummeted down under a 2 for whatever reason. I mean, there's a lot of factors involved. It's not just what you eat. It's cortisol levels. It's inflammation in your body. It's maybe you're fighting off something. You know, I've heard for women, it could be a certain time of their month. Um, all different, I mean, the body is super complex. So you, you just can't make an assumption 
it's all about food. It is mostly about food, but there's a lot of other factors that can throw it off. A uh, really good point to make is like inflammation. Like if you're eating you know, a ton of vegetable oils, omega-6s, and your ratio gets way off, it can cause inflammation in your system. Uh, maybe there's a hidden sugar source you're not aware of, and that's coming in. Maybe, I mean, stevia is, some stevia could be semi-keto approved, but in some people, maybe it still spikes your um, blood sugars to a point. So all this can be tested with gl the glucometer, and I highly recommend doing that because you know, in one person might be okay, another person might not. So, and, you know, depending on the stage of, you know, what your biochemistry is, how much you've damaged your body over the years and everything like that. Um, one other takeaway is for me specifically, glutamates in the diet, like MSG is one of like, you know, 100 glutamates uh, that is marketed and packaged under different products. You know, you have your yeast extracts, your autolyzed proteins, your, you know, just everything like that under the sun. Even the gluten molecule, within the gluten molecule, there's a percentage, I think it's like 40% of it has like the glutamate um, structure in it. So you get that, you get the glutamate response and you get uh, casein also converts to glutamate, as aspartic acid from aspartame also converts to glu uh, glutamate. Uh, not to confuse it with glutamine, not to confuse it with glutamic acid, which is the amino acid precursor to glutamate, and not to confuse what I'm talking about glutamate as maybe all glutamates because it's really the free form glutamate that's the problem, at least in my system. So um, just like you have a, a free sugar molecule, like when you get the high fructose corn syrup, you have the individual molecules already separated and coming into the bloodstream. That also works that way with free glutamate, and a lot of people don't know this, where you can already have it broken down to its basic component, that salt version of glutamic acid, and when it enters the bloodstream, it immediately interacts. Now, the reason why it's a problem in me and a problem in a lot of people is that they're, from what I've read, um, don't quote me on this specifically, but I've read this in the past, and a lot of doctors are advocating it now. They say that glutamate spikes your insulin levels in your bloodstream in higher concentrations. I don't know what, what the concentration was, what the tests were done, but um, it makes sense from the standpoint that there's MADA receptors, which is the glutamate receptor all throughout the body, through the cardiovascular system, uh, in the, uh, from the pancreas, so it has some control over the release of insulin, the glutamate itself. So some of the tests that they've talked about were uh, sugars um, were not given to the control group and just glutamate was given and it just sparked an insulin release without any sugar in the bloodstream. So if um, I'll have to dig up that article or find uh, where, I've, where I've seen it, but I know there's a lot of people out there on the internet that have quoted the similar kind of thing. Hopefully it's not just a myth that's going around. But uh, from my perspective, it makes a lot of sense because in my system, glutamate causes blood pressure surges, and so like I spike and then come back down hard after ingesting glutamate, and I can see this literally. So I can see um, like these spots develop in my retinal capillaries. They like surge and they bulge. Um, that's what's going on in my retina. And what happens is I see these little spots form about 30 to 60 minutes after I eat something high in glutamate. And from the ophthalmologist's point of view, what's happening is a little bit of rupturing of the capillaries happening in the retina, and a little bit of blood seepage can be coming out when it's really severe and drying in the in the gel part of the of the retina, or right in the eye itself, beyond the retina. And it's the drying of that blood that over time can cause blood spots to just stay there and the, the body and the, the eye naturally takes away the blood spot so even if you have a temporary blindness of like even three or four or five days a lot of times it'll clear up on its own um, even after months like I had a blind spot in my late 20s where it was like kind of the size of a quarter and you couldn't like really read anything during that time because it would just make you dizzy and you know you've got that stigmatism kind of going on with having this blind spot in one eye and nothing in the other eye and you see um, that you're like literally looking through the blood, which is opaque, it's not transparent at all. So, um, luckily in my case, that almost required surgery to go in and laser out that blood spot, but instead what ended up happening was uh, the, the body just 
absorbed it and magically one morning, like three months later after it originally formed after one meal, um, it just went away on its own. Now, like I said, this is a condition in me. I don't know if, if it spikes other people's blood, blood, uh, blood pressure in that ways. And also at that time I was really overweight. Um, I was probably like maybe 260 or 280 at that time. And I was ingesting a lot of sugars with having higher blood pressure overall with the glutamate. So I think it was like this tandem effect of really easily able to like cause more blood pressure shifts in my system at that time. Now since then, especially in like the last five years since I started doing low carb and then transitioned to keto and did intermittent fasting and then really went off that and then went back to keto hardcore, you know, all during that time, just eliminating the grains which have a ton of glutamate, free glutamate sources in them, and eliminating just all the other known uh, natural glutamate sources. Uh, just pretty much, I don't have any vision problem whatsoever, and I don't see any of the blood spots happen. Um, although I do see, on a rare occasion after a meal, um, I usually correlate it to, like a, like a year ago, I saw a couple spots appearing, and um, I realized I had like some beets, because beets, uh, beets, peas, tomatoes, uh, cheese, especially the aged cheese like Parmesan, all these naturally have glutamates in them. So, uh, like I said, if in my system I just, I highly suspect glutamate itself as a cause of releasing insulin because of the studies, the other studies done that have nothing to do with my condition, but because I'm so sensitive to glutamate, I'm just assuming that um, I probably just output a lot of um, insulin when I take in glutamate as well. So I avoid that uh, specifically. Um, might not be for anyone else, but um, it's probably a suspect thing that people aren't thinking about when they're doing a ketogenic diet and they're trying to lower their glucose levels uh, because of lowering their insulin levels. The, the, the very thing, the very controller glutamate, which is your main neurological controller in your brain, also is throughout your whole body. So uh, just keep that in mind if you happen to be like just chewing away on a ton of glutamate. But what I've noticed is the ketogenic diet doesn't have a lot of sources, especially if you're not doing dairy. You really are um, pretty low on the glutamate side anyway. And I've even found glutamic acid, the amino acid, uh, even a few years ago when I was ingesting like directly the amino acid in a little higher concentration, I still wasn't getting the reactions. It's just the, the free glutamate. It's not really the glutamic acid. The body like probably has the ability to break the glutamic acid down into the salt version and create glutamate when the body needs it. Um, another thing I've learned about this subject is the glutamate molecule is highly regulated in the bloodstream just like uh, for your glu glucose levels you only have about a teaspoon maybe two teaspoons if you're a really big person of sugar or glucose specifically in your bloodstream at any given time well on the glutamate side it's even more highly regulated than like a teaspoon it's like you know I don't know millimolar or whatever it is I, I saw some stuff on a CDC or a FDA site about glutamate present in the bloodstream and the regulation of it and I was just shocked that even that's really highly regulated so you know when you get a flood of it from your intestines right into your bloodstream um, when you adjust that free form it's gotta like the body has to be like going just like ah react you know get you know process deal with this excess glutamate that I didn't expect same like similar process with the with the glucose obviously where we just flood our bodies with all these carbohydrates and you know, the liver goes, ah, I'm shipping the fructose, and the pancreas goes, ah, I put out all the insulin to compensate for it. So, um, with that said, I just wanted to bring up that, that part of the equation that I've never really heard anybody talk about on all the keto channels that I watch on YouTube and such. So, kind of a big tangent there with the glutamate. So, getting back to keto adapted, yeah, you want to be keto adapted. Um, you want to really have the glucometer to really understand your glucose levels, to understand your understand your ketone levels and how they kind of like indirectly are proportionate to each other over time and see what you generally are at. Because if you don't do that, uh, I find um, you're just like kind of like you know taking just a big stab in the dark, and it's it's better to know your numbers at some point. Um, unless you are just really confident that your diet is so strict that you know that you're not getting any other carb sources and 
you know, you're getting your sleep really well, you're not producing a lot of cortisol, just if everything else is going well and you just feel great and you feel really even all the time, you're probably good on your way to being keto adapted. But again, keto adaptation takes, I would say, months. Um, for me, it took months to really get my body to want to use the fuel rather than carb sources. So, uh, yeah, it, it, takes, it takes a while to first establish it and then once you're in it and you fall back out of it, let's say if you happen to go over to somebody's house like I did a few weeks ago and have some uh, apple cobbler because you didn't want to turn them down because they slaved away at an oven for two hours to make it just for you uh, because they didn't know you're on a keto diet. <laughs> so I had I had that late at night um, and I had some others. I was really good the whole day and I thought for sure the next day, okay, I'm totally falling out of my keto adaptation, took my numbers, and I was shocked that I was still in it. My, my keto numbers were above like a 2.3 um, that morning. My glucose levels were still back down. They were like around a 77, something like that. And I was just like, wow, like my body knows about the fat. It knows about using it. When I do go out of my way now and eat, like I went out of my way that, to eat that cobbler, um, just for that moment because I didn't want to like disappoint the person who made it and I was like okay I think I'm screwing myself here for maybe three four five days but if that was maybe two years ago and I would have done that I would have been screwing myself and I would have to spend a whole maybe like three or four more days to get back into keto adaptation but I found at least that side of it um, tasted really sugary I don't really know how much sugar I ingested I had an entire slice and uh, there was ice cream, but it was on the side. I didn't eat it. I just let it melt. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I would say, uh, I'd say, like <clears throat> over time, um, when you become more of a fat-burning machine, then when you have something carbo, like a little higher carbo, uh, you can get away with it more down the road. But if you're just starting out, like especially in the first year, it's good to just like try not to, of course, even tempt yourself with that. Um, just from the addiction, the addictive point of the sugars, right? <laughs> so uh, when I do introduce my carbos now, I'm pretty smart about it, and I'll do it. But right before, I'll actually use it as fuel before a workout. Never, I'll never use carbs after a workout. So before a workout, um, like I do some uh, like soccer events. As a matter of fact, tomorrow night I'm going to do a soccer event, and I'll have like maybe a handful of cherries and. Uh, maybe a little bit of cabbage, something that's a veggie that's a little higher in carbo content. So it'll be fueling me for that. I'll be working out for at least 15 minutes and doing sprinting all over the field as a fullback. So uh, that will help me power through that. Um, and same like if I do yard work, I know I'm going to be doing hours of yard work outside. I'll even take a break halfway through and I might reload on maybe another handful of like strawberries or berries or something. and you know, use that as my fuel um, and it'll just power me through and keep me even. And on the back end, then, you know, I'll refuel with protein and a little bit of protein um, and a higher amount of fat. Uh, protein in my system, uh, you gotta, like, I'll do a whole another video at some point on gluconeogenesis, but there's a point at which if you do run out of fuel, you don't want to get your body into a state of just burning off the muscle, right? So it's in some ways it's good making sure you're you are giving yourself adequate fuel for the type of exercise you're doing, and then on the backside um, refuel, refueling yourself and giving yourself enough you know protein on the back end. Now it doesn't take much. Um, like in me, I might just you know chomp away on like 20 grams of protein and that's it. I won't like take it up like other people after a workout really high. Um, I'm way more sensitive. Um, in that respect, I, I think I have a really good ability to go into gluconeogenesis, so I'm, I've been very cautious with the proteins uh, because that's what I screwed up, you know, a year ago, and it was it didn't take much. I was like maybe 30 to 40 grams of protein um, at a meal, and that would be enough to just uh, start more of a gluconeogenesis effect in my system. So really timing the workouts with the food, like you'll get used to that over time too and you'll know what works best for you and the types of foods that work best. So that's about it for today. I uh, hope everyone's doing good out there and talk to you later. All right, bye.